Good afternoon. I'm Professor Roger Martinez Davila, and welcome back to our lecture series, Medieval Plague, Modern Pandemic. The Italian Renaissance humanist Giovanni Boccaccio pinned his mid 14th century collection of novellas, Decameron, in the midst of the Black Death of 1347 to 1353. In his poem, he writes, let me say then that 1,348 years had passed since the fruitful incarnation of the Son of God, when the deadly plague arrived in the noble city of Florence, the most beautiful of any in Italy. Although these words and their phrasing are antiquarian, we understand their meaning. A devastating disease descended on Florence and now invaded all of Europe. Today, we will follow in the steps of Boccaccio, emulating the literary structure of his Decameron that spins its stories over the course of 10 days. These lectures will follow the form of Boccaccio, 10 days, 10 lectures. Boccaccio frames Decameron's 100 stories by creating the literary device of a group of young men and women sequestered in a countryside as they flee the plague in Florence to entertain and educate each other both were purposes that were crucial to the medieval reader. This mixed sex brigata shared their stories over the course of a fortnight or two weeks. The stories explored many themes that bridged the medieval world to the Renaissance. Fortune and intelligence, love and sex, ingenuity and deception, religion and morality, to name just a few themes. In later lectures, we will return to the innovating nature of Decameron, but this week we will begin our first day by examining, understanding, and reflecting on the past and present. We will ask on this day, what was the Black Death and what were the immediate societal impacts of the plague from 1347 to 1353? The first day. Yes, in the year 1348, the Ursinia pestis bacterium arrived in Italy and unleashed among the most destructive communicable diseases, the plague, and a global pandemic that was 60 to 90% fatal within three to six days after the appearance of its symptoms. Transmitted by seafaring flea-infested rats to the Italian peninsula in 1347, over the course of six years, it indiscriminately struck European and Mediterranean populations. The mortality rates across Europe were devastating and highly variable, approximately 30 to 35% in England and Central Europe, 40 to 50% in Scandinavia, and as high as 50 to 60% in Spain, Italy, and France. It was the Middle Ages Black Death of 1347 to 1353, and it forever changed the course of human history. Three Plagues The Black Death was not the first recorded pandemic or an outbreak of disease that occurs over a wide geographic area and affects an exceptionally high proportion of the population that had ever ravaged humanity. But it has captured our modern attention perhaps because it epitomizes the well-worn one-dimensional trope of the medieval dark ages. Nonetheless, it appears to have been the deadliest of the plague pandemics over the course of the last 2000 years. There were three prominent plague pandemics. The first plague pandemic was the plague of Justinian, which raged across the Byzantine Empire starting in 541, extending as far north as England and Ireland before subsiding in 750. This plague was not a one-time event. It afflicted the Byzantine Empire in reoccurring outbreaks, 18 major disease events over the course of approximately 200 years. The second plague pandemic, the focus of this series of lectures, came to be known as the Black Death, the medieval Black Death first appearing in the Qinghai Tibet Plateau and infecting China as early as 1331, migrated with traders along the Silk Route. Now that road is considered more of a network of interconnecting nodes and routes bonding trading communities together into this Mediterranean world, as well as another pathway via the militaristic expansion of the Mongolian Golden Horde into Central Asia via the city of Kaffa, 
on the Black Sea. Scholars of Islamic and Jewish history track the pandemic's march into the Mediterranean using Jewish business transactions recorded on paper and papyrus records gathered at the famous Cairo Haniza, a storehouse connected to the medieval synagogue in Fustat, Egypt. In 1347 or 1348, the plague appeared almost simultaneously in Asia Minor, Constantinople, and Egypt. In Cairo, one of the many Islamic metropolises that dwarfed cities in Europe, an estimated 200 persons perished. Thereafter, it advanced its attack on Europe in the same years. Some scholars, such as Mark Welford in his text Geographies of Pandemics, argue that the continuous reoccurrence of plague redirected the European Middle Ages onto a different and consequential path to modernity. He states, Plague has killed tens if not hundreds of millions of people over the last 2,000 to 2,500 years, and yet has been responsible for some of the most critical innovations in public health, those of quarantine and disease surveillance. Plague also helped in feudalism by inflating labor wages and possibly ceded the transfer economic power from Mediterranean North to the Northwest Europe during the medieval period by decimating the trading superpowers at Venice, Genova, and Florence. Plague victims were also catapulted into Kaffa in 1346 by the Mongols under Janabeg in an attempt to break the siege and therefore represents the first use of biological terror weapons. While some of Welford's positions should invite a healthy discussion, particularly that plague was one of the demises of feudalism, his overarching position is a fundamentally sound one. Massive contagious diseases have had an undeniable role in shaping human affairs. We are not the ultimate masters of the earth. The earth is a global organism that respirates, and when it becomes ill, humanity is deeply impacted. The third plague pandemic, which some scholars consider to be an extension of the prior one, is the most notable for its initial appearance in Canton and Hong Kong in 1894, and thereafter extending to India through 1910. An estimated 13 million persons succumbed to the illness, and in spite of the human toll, it did not challenge the mortality of the medieval Black Death that claimed as many as 20 million souls, or one out of three persons. Reflection. Why do we forget? What is it about humanity and the way we perceive time that allows us to forget the difficulties of past pandemics? Shouldn't we have learned something by now to better prepare ourselves? Tracking the disease from Crimea to Italy. When the pandemic arrived in Italy at the opening of the 14th century, an estimated 12.5 million persons lived on the peninsula. Italian cities were perpetually lacking sufficient grains and other foods to meet the needs of the people. Italian city-states often created what were called offices of abundance to manage the importation of cereal grains from Sicily to the south, Provence to the west, and even Islamic Egypt. This importation of food via vast trade networks crossing land and sea facilitated the survival of the people, but also created an avenue for the peste to invade. Reading the history of this medieval menace of Yersinia pestis bacteria in Italy, and for that matter in Europe, seems to track with what we are encountering with the COVID-19 coronavirus in 2020 and on our globe. That is, three phases of infection. Phase one involved enzoetic and epizoetic transfer the disease from rats to humans. In the case of coronavirus, some transfer from animals to humans. Phase two, an endemic phase when the disease took hold in a few households, incubated, and then spread illness and death from one family member to another. And finally, in phase three, it became an epidemic where the local officials and villages and cities would not fully understand the presence of the Black Death until five to seven weeks after the first infection. It is a macabre repeating of history some 600 years later. In Italy, let us turn our attention to the first evidence of plague in northern 
Italy, that is, near the city of Genoa. The history of this plague invasion into northern Italy tracks with another, the Mongol invasion of Crimea. Janibeg, the Mongol Khan of the Golden Horde, invaded Central Asia and the northern region adjacent to the Sea of Azov between 1343 and 1347. The Sea of Azov sits atop the Black Sea, which is bordered by present-day Ukraine, Russia, Georgia, Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania. The Venetian and Genoa merchants operated crucial trade cities in the region, such as at the city of Tana and Kaffa on the Crimea. At the opening of the 14th century, the Khanate had converted to Islam, and as it moved westward, it sought to convert local Tartar peoples and push Christian traders out of the region via massive military force. By 1343, the Golden Horde pushed into the Sea of Azov and eliminated the Venetian trading town of Tana, or present-day Azov. Italian merchants then retreated to a fortified Genoese installation at Gaffa. The site had started as a collection of warehouses and trading stations, but as business had become more lucrative, the Genoese converted it into a fortified city. When the Mongols besieged Kaffa in the autumn of 1346, they also brought the plague. The disease first attacked the Mongol armies, but in one of the most consequential forms of biological warfare, the Mongols launched plague-ridden bodies into the walled city using trebuchets. From the memoir of Gabriele de Musi, a Genoese notary, a recounting of the events can be told. Although there is uncertainty as to whether de Musi was present for the attack, his memoir written in 1348 remains the only contemporary report that presumably was based on first-person stories. He wrote, The Christian merchants who had been driven out by force from Tana were so terrified of the power of the Tartars that to save themselves and their belongings, they fled in an armed ship to Kaffa, a settlement in the same part of the world which had been founded long ago by the Genoese. O oh God, see how the heathen Tartar races, pouring together from all sides, suddenly invested the city of Kaffa and besieged the trapped Christians there for almost three years. There, hemmed in by an immense army, they could hardly draw breath, although food could be shipped in, which offered them some hope. But behold, the whole army was afflicted by a disease which overran the Tartars and killed thousands upon thousands every day. It was as though the arrows were raining down from heaven to strike and crush the Tartars' arrogance. All medical advice and intention was useless. The Tartars died as soon as the signs of disease appeared on their bodies, swellings in the armpit or growing caused by coagulating humors followed by a putrid fever. The dying Tartars, stunned and stupefied by the immensity of the disaster brought about by the disease, and realizing they had no hope of escape, lost interest in the siege. But they ordered corpses to be placed in catapults and lobbed into the city in the hope that the intolerable stench would kill everyone inside. What seemed like mountains of dead were thrown into the city, and the Christians could not hide or flee or escape from them, although they dumped as many of the bodies as they could in the sea. And soon the rotting corpses tainted the air and poisoned the water supply, and the stench was so overwhelming that hardly one in several thousand was in a position to flee the remains of the Tartar army. Moreover, one infected man could carry the poison to others and infect people and places with disease by look alone. No one knew or could discover a means of defense. As it happened, among those who escaped from Kaffa by boat were a few sailors who had been infected with the poisonous disease. Some boats were bound for Genoa, others went to Venice and to other Christian areas. When the sailors reached these places and mixed with the people there, it was as if they had brought evil spirits with them. Every city every settlement, every place was poisoned by the contagious pestilence, and their inhabitants, both men and women, died suddenly. Scholars like Professor 
Mark Wheelis, conclude that mutilated disease cadavers could have infected the community of Kaffa based on contemporary research on plague infection in the United States from 1970 to 1995. 20% of these American plague cases were associated with infected materials. Moreover, we understand infected Genoese refugees could have taken the disease home with them. Historical records indicate that during the spring of 1347, Genoese and Phoenician galleys escaping Kaffa first traveled to Constantinople by May 1347. Phoenician galleys reached the Isle of Crete next and subsequently reached their home port in Venice by mid-November 1347. The Genoese galleys first reached Messina, Sicily in June 1347 and landed at their home port of Genoa in July. Converging shipping lanes and trade routes in Genoa, subsequently, much like a modern international airport like Newark or LAX, express shipped diseased travelers, merchants, and goods onto Marseille and on and on and on. By 1348, the plague was in France, Germany, Spain, and England. Onward through 1352, it breached the walled cities of Switzerland, the Low Countries, Scandinavia, Poland, and Russia. Reflection Is human interconnection, past and present, a good social trait for societies? In this new global age, we value our ability to experience the globe's cultural panorama through travel. But is this a good trait? And what are the pitfalls? Genoa, welcome home, swollen bodies and words of comfort. In Genoa in late 1347, we would find a bustling port city of 60,000 souls. You can almost hear the creaking oak of the galleys moored in the city and the laughter of the evenings that welcome both the native wines and the good cheer of fathers and sons, uncles and good friends now home from their challenging voyage. The affluent trading families would have enjoyed tables set with the bounty of abundant basil plants, the sweet fragrance of olive oil, and the rich cesta parmigiano coming together in the traditional pesto and pasta of Genoa. Warm focaccia, all varieties of this staple bread with onions and olives, sage carrying their delightful perfume to the nose. Those first nights and days home, they would have been good. But then the first day home would become two, and two would become three. A week and then two weeks would have passed. Some families would see the odd swellings, the buboes, appearing on loved ones' bodies, bodies distorted and swollen, lymph nodes on the neck now the size of eggs, foreheads burning with fever, and finally, maybe coughed up blood in the loss of one's bowels. Skin sore sinning, a new disturbing signal of pending death, a blackness an evil shade of the dark, a black death. Three weeks, four weeks. Now five weeks later, since the first evening of tight embraces, when the Genoese galleys had made their way home from Kaffa on the Crimean Peninsula. Over the course of this first raging black death in Genoa, that city of 60,000 was perhaps reduced to 36,000 survivors by 1353. Among those unfortunate and unsuspecting who were laid to rest in plague graves was a nameless woman, about 30 years of age and expecting a child. Alongside of her, a child of three years of age, another of 12 years and on the verge of the age of majority. Laid together as an immediate family, we do not know, but now presenting themselves as a family of the dead. The graveyard is located at the ruins 
of a small church of San Nicolau. Alongside of it, the foundations of a medieval hospital founded by the Fichy family of Genoa during the 1200s, an entire site, a cluster of buildings originally constructed to spiritually and materially care for traders and pilgrims would have been travel- who have been traveling these lands to the neighboring regions of Emilia Romana and Tuscany. Archaeological work at the site, conducted between 2001 and 2006, tells another quiet history of the plague. Four persons laid at to rest at this rural site were not the wealthy merchants of the city. Their bodies tell another story of deprivation of the most essential needs of life. Basic food sustenance. And they, they speak of, of a poverty of the common people during the Middle Ages. We know the site was infected by the plague because genetic markers are still detectable in the cadavers, the F1 antigens of the bacterium. Yes, plague killed them, but that is not the complete history. The woman of 30 was of typical height for the region, just over five feet or 156 centimeters tall. At the age of seven, her teeth indicate that its enamel had not properly formed Instead, bands of thin enamel point to a childhood malnutrition and illness. Her body told another story of decay at just 30 years of age. You can almost feel the pain she endured as she walked. Her left hip joint, where the head of the femur was shaped like a mushroom. She suffered from osteoarthritis, it's believed, and she was pregnant. Her unborn child about 30 to 40 weeks old, just days away from being delivered. In the most tragic element of this death, it appears that after the burial, the woman's body experienced what was known as a coffin birth. The fetus partially delivered in post-mortem. The two children buried with the expectant mother showed signs of hard beginnings. The 12-year-old had bone lesions associated with metabolic and nutritional deficiencies, namely a poor diet in fruits and vegetables and vitamin C deficiency. She likely suffered from scurvy. We cannot know the entire circumstances of their passing. But we can understand and reflect on their suffering before the Black Death and with its arrival. We can imagine if a Catholic priest was present at their internment, that he may have turned to Jacopo de Frazzi's well-known collection of 13th century sermons, the Legenda Royale, or Golden Legend, to remind all those present to remember and take comfort in their celestial Lord. The Golden Legend was a compendium of, life's, of saints' lives and liturgy intended to assist busy priests with rich materials for their sermons to the faithful. It seems fitting, perhaps a mystical communion with those that passed away, that a preacher may have encountered Jacopo's writings of, on St. Nicholas, the patron saint at the church of this location. Maybe we can imagine those words he spoke that day. I leave you now with the golden legend's wisdom. The life of St. Nicholas was written by learned men of Argos called Argolix. Argos being a town in Greece. There came a time when St. Nicholas province was beset by a famine so severe that no one had anything to eat. The man of God learned that several ships laden with grain were anchored in the harbor. He hastened there promptly and begged the ship's people to come to the aid of those who were starving, if only by allowing them a hundred measures of wheat from each ship. But they replied, Father, we dare not, because our cargo is measured at Alexandria, and we must deliver it whole and entire to the emperor's granaries. 
The saint answered, Do what I tell you, and I promise you in God's power that the imperial customs men will not find your cargo short. The men did so, and when they arrived at their destination, they turned over to the imperial granaries the same quantity of grain that had been measured out at Alexandria. They spread news of the miracle and glorified God in his saint. Meanwhile, the grain they had relinquished was distributed by Nicholas to each according to his needs. And so miraculously, that not only did it, it suffice to feed the whole region for two years, but supplied enough for the sowing. Maybe the medieval priest may have added as the grave was closed, you are now with the Lord. He will provide for you and make your bellies full. No longer shall your toils bring a meager scrap of bread. No longer shall your sleep be restless because of your hunger. No longer shall you want for what you do not have. You will no longer need these earthly nourishments as he will make you full in the eternal sustenance of his spirit. Amen.